when I tried to get them to explain themselves, is, yeah. what do you mean by calcium ion? Can you explain to me where in the cell is the calcium ion going and how does it interfere with muscular contraction? They threatened to beat me up. Oh, so I, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warning. You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. All right, greetings, Earthlings. That is I, Dr. Todd Lee, and with me I have Dr. Mike Isratel, and we are going to talk to you today about all things atrophy. If you don't know who Dr. Isratel is, I've got kind of like a man crush on him. He's like the world's smartest man. He's almost a pro bodybuilder. He's a professor of exophysiology. He's a doctor, although he doesn't claim to be a real doctor, which I think is quite charming. He is the creator of RP, the RP app, the other RP app. And he also created Dr. Jared Feather in his ball sack. How are you today? I mean... Jared's mother also had some hand in that, but uh, yeah, I was mostly yeah, I know. my balls. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good, man. It's good to be on. Thanks for having me. So, I've got a few questions for you, and I thought maybe it'd be easier for formatting if I went through them first, and then you could tell me which order you want to do them in. Uh, just from the first one is fine. All right, so establishing MV, MRV, and MEV. Now, not everyone is obsessed with your work. So I'm going to go over some of the basics. So, and correct me since you're there, your terms. One of the things I thought was most brilliant about your work was when you were with Juggernaut and a whiteboard, it was just, you had this chart and you explained that there is maintenance volume, minimum effective volume, and maximum recoverable volume as a continuum. And that as one would deduce, the maintenance volume is the minimum number of sets per week to keep your tissue that minimum of volume is the threshold one must cross in volume in order to stimulate some growth and maximum recoverable volume is when that growth becomes or when the stimulus becomes too excessive for you to recover your next bout of how does one figure out what their mv mev and mrv is I have my ideas, but you are the creator of these terms, so you have the best answer, I'm sure. Yeah, a good question. So MV is an interesting one to figure out. It takes some time because you have to go down to roughly about a third of your typical MAV estimate, maximum adaptive volume, which is like somewhere between MEV and MRV. So let's say your MEV is eight sets per week or something. And then your MRV is 12. Take one third of 10 and you're right around three to four sets per week. That would be your first guess as to maintenance volume. Okay. And during a phase of training in which you're training for maintenance only, you would train with that volume and see how things went. You're looking mostly at performance mesocycle to mesocycle to mesocycle. So it takes a while. But if your performance is stable, then you're right around maintenance volume. If your performance is declining, you probably need to increase your volume. And thus, your maintenance volume is higher. So when you go up by two sets a week or something, and you see how that affects your performance. And if that stabilizes it, then your maintenance volume. If you're still gaining strength after multiple mesocycles, it's clearly too much volume for maintenance and there's enough volume for you to gain. It's actually above your minimum effective volume at that point. And then uh, at that point you go and you um, lower the volume that you had at first. So if it's three sets, I'm going to try two sets a week and see how that works. And the direct literature has been pretty convincing so far that maintenance volume is quite low for people, right around a third, but sometimes even lower for extended periods of time. So that's how you'd find maintenance volume. Okay. Um, and I think you established MEV by accident in that explanation is that if you're making gains in progress, if you're getting stronger, you're likely growing tissue, assuming you're not a beginner and you're out of that phase. Is that correct? Oh, uh, that broke up a lot. Can you say that again? 
Oh, it's breaking up again. All right. So, oh, yeah. Oh, has it been breaking up this whole time? Yeah, more or less. All right. So, well, why don't you continue with MEV, how to establish MEV? Uh, so, MEV is your minimum effective volume. And then mm-hmm. we have to try to measure effect, which uh, usually we measure by rep strength. And so if mesocycle over mesocycle, you are gaining repetition strength, then you're either at your MEV or above your MEV. Because you don't know if those gains are minimal gains or not. But what you want to do is every um, chance you get after concluding that you are, in fact, still getting stronger for reps, you want to start a little lower with volume in the next method cycle and try to keep your volume stable. Let's say if you really, really wanted to figure this out. And if that lower start and you stay at that volume range, if that still gives you some kind of benefit, you still increase in strength over time, then it is close to or above your MEV. The first time, let's say you're doing six sets on average per week and you were making gains, slow gains, but you were, and then you drop to four four sets per week for whatever chest or something like that. And then when you don't make any gains for a few mile cycles on four, then, you know, six, somewhere between four and six, five or six is roughly your minimum effective volume because that's at six you're gaining and at four you're not. That means your minimum effective volume has to be somewhere in that region on average. Um, There are other ways to really, really guesstimate MEV. They're not very good as far as accuracy is concerned, but they can be informative as far as real-world program design because if you spend a long time trying to see what your minimum effective volume is, there's a very good argument that that is a huge use of time to get the worst possible gains you could get. That's not really a good use of time. It's cool for theoretical purposes. We'd love to do it in experimental subjects. But it's no good in practical purposes because, for the love of God, you know, you don't want to tell someone for four to six months to make their minimum gains or try to find their minimum gains or even try to find where they're not making any gains, which is a part of the MEV exploratory process. And so for MEV, sometimes it's a little bit better to use proxies. So if you're getting some kind of slight pump, a little bit of slight disruption and fatigue to the muscle, then it's probably close to its MEV. If you're getting almost no pump whatsoever and essentially no disruption, it's unlikely that that's above your minimum effective volume. So you can, every single mesocycle at the beginning of it, kind of stop your training when you have a decent pump and uh, you notice that you get a little bit of uh, fatigue from it and a little bit of soreness and tightness. That's probably where you can start the rest of the meso or certainly not increase by a ton when you come back in. So uh, that's MEV. And then MRV is uh, the easiest one to find. You just uh, keep increasing volume over time, slowly, one set here and there, until you lose your ability to continue to progress in strength, by either plateauing or regressing in strength. And once you do that, look, okay, like that happened at, you know, 20 sets of biceps. Let's see next week or next mesocycle after deload if I can go up any higher. And so you sort of try to progress to 22 sets. And you might notice that it's 22 successful. Okay, now you know you're going to read something like 20, 22, maybe, maybe you go to 24 next time. But next time you go to 24, uh, by the time you get to 22, your body's like, dude, fuck that. Nope. And it shuts down the progress and it, you're just making the same result of the week after you hit 22 or even get weaker. And then it's starting to get pretty obvious that something like 22 is kind of your number. Now, are you expected to get that kind of granularity for most normal training? No, not really. But what I contend, and I think this is important, is that these kinds of methods to figure out your MV, MEV, MRV, first of all, you can do them in normal training. And through normal training, you'll get a feel for these sorts of things. We all do maintenance phases every now and again. Maybe those are less common, but then it's less important to find out MV. We all start or all supposed to start a little on the easier end in a mesocycle and work up towards the more difficult end. So really, you started an MEV estimate and you ended an MRV estimate for your mesocycle. And you can always update that. Every meso, you change the MEV a little bit, change the MRV a little bit, see how it does, or change the estimate, rather. 
and see if it's like actually performing like it is. So for example, if you estimate your MEV for biceps is, you know, two sets, but after two sets, you don't feel shit. Yeah, it's probably like four. Do you do four total and then you're feeling something or you estimate that it's four and you get sore so much in your biceps that it fucks up your next workout later that week. Okay, that's definitely not MEV. Um, that is going to be significantly higher. So maybe my MEV is like at two. So you can use always use logic like that every single time to update your priors and continue to get better at knowing your own body. And then for MRV, you could say, oh, I think, you know, 18 sets of biceps is like all I have this time. You do 18 and the next week um, on deload, you're like, dude, I'm not even fucking tired. I can PR right now. Then, yeah, next time try to go to 20 or 22 and then you can realize, wow, I'm still 22. I wasn't even messed up. Like, it's all good. And geez, you know, your MRV for biceps in the context of that program might be substantially higher. And so here's the super important part. So important part one is you can always do this and get these numbers, um, continuous data. It's not like you have to do these experiments where you take months off and try to do this. That's that's stupid. You can do it on the fly, especially through proxies. The other big important point is I can't tell you, even if I run your program for you, even if I'm personal training you in the gym every day, I can't tell you if your MRV for biceps is 20 sets or 21 sets. I can't do that. Um, however, what I can probably reliably tell you after training you for some time, and you can tell yourself after training yourself some time, is that your MRV for biceps probably isn't 15 and probably isn't 25. And it's probably somewhere closer to 20, as an example. So if we can get an, a precision of roughly five sets, some people would accurately say that, geez, that's not that impressive. Agreed. But it's way better than having nothing. You know, like if you're going to buy a car at the, uh, you know, at the, at the dealership and they can't tell you the exact price, but they can tell you by like slices of 5,000, like is this car 20,000 or is it 25,000? That's a very, very, very meaningful thing to know. And because we know that MVs all the way to MRVs range from five-ish sets per muscle per week, all the way comfortably into the mid twenties in a whole body program. And sometimes when you reduce the volume on other muscles, you don't train as much. You can go up to the thirties, forties and fifties convincingly of sets per week per muscle. And that while those are a bit more extreme cases, if we say, okay, let's just cool it and say that stuff's all kind of very, very contextual. Realistically, your volume landmarks, as we call them collectively, could be between five and 25 sets per week per muscle. Well, fuck, man, if that's the range and every muscle in your body might occupy somewhere in that range, knowing if it's five-ish or 10-ish or 15-ish or 20-ish or 25-ish for some muscle, depending on landmark we're talking about, I mean, that's big time, big time insight. For example, if your minimum effective volume for biceps, you have like pretty resistant biceps to growth, let's say, is like 10, but you start your typical program at about six, but it's like a three weeks before you get to even, even making your biceps at all bigger. On the other hand, if you think your back can recover from from 25 sets of movement per week, but your MRV is 20, I mean, the, the last two weeks of every program you do for back is going to be a gigantic clusterfuck where you just lose reps and lose load and feel like shit and start pulling your muscles and all this other crap and your systemic fatigue goes crazy. And you're like, what's wrong with my program? What's not the motherfucker? You're just like, it's like a little kid that... You know, you, you take your kid to the restaurant. You're like, all right, you know, we're at our favorite place again. What do you want? And he's like, I want two mac and cheese bowls. You're like, okay, Billy, you only ever eat one. You actually haven't finished a single bowl of mac and cheese here in the last three times we've been here. I promise you, I'll order you another bowl if you finish the first one. It's so, so stupid to order two bowls right up front because you know he's not going to eat it. Same idea as if you're like, yeah, man, I'm doing this bicep program, 25 sets a week from the get-go. You're like, what? are you doing? That may be beyond your maximum, maximum recoverable volume, not even minimum effective volume. So getting to know your own landmarks within five plus or minus two or three um, sets per week, it's, it's super important to get your program just basically oriented for good results. That's it. That's it. It's like setting your cruise control when the speed limit's 70. You can go as fast as 77. You can go as slow as 63 or whatever, but like if you're going 90, you're getting fucking arrested. And if you're going 50, you're causing accidents or people are honking at you all the time. So even if it's not perfect precision, it's goddamn good information that makes you way, way better at training. So that's kind of tendency to see the issue. The only way around that is 
if you have the RPI hypertrophy app, it actually does all those numbers for you under the hood. So you just train how you train and by how you rate your workouts, it'll update your numbers every week. And you don't have to learn any of that stuff, but it's good to have a conceptual understanding of it. Even if you do use the app, because the app is programmable to whatever you want. So if you tell it, Hey, I want to do 20 sets. It's like, okay, I'm going to stop you. But if you know, maximum recover volume is a concept. And you know that every time you try to do like 22 or more sets of triceps per week, your shit falls off the bone. Don't do 25. That, that's my humblest way of, of uh, kind of uh, addressing these topics is I'm not claiming to be a person that knows within one set or half a set, how many biceps you need this week. But I'm saying on average, yeah, chunks of five, I think it's meaningful. So it's interesting you bring that up. The last time I used the app, I finished a meso cycle and I had, I was handling more weight with those particular exercises in that particular workout than I'd ever done before. And I was getting up to like absurd amount of volume, like maybe eight sets of tricep three times a week and to like 14 sets of lats twice a week. And I was making progress, but it was time to get this, um, I had to go in for surgery and after two weeks of recovery of surgery, go back and I'm handling the same low, but I get sore after maybe four sets. So I, I drastically overestimated where my MRV would be when I came, when I calculated my MEV and I over on it. So I was basically backpedaling, subtracting a set every week for several weeks. Um, and I guess that brings me to my next point is, I use soreness as a measure if I'm at MRV. So for example, if I have 72 hours to grow muscle and then after that 70 hours, it's kind of pointless to wait. So you're supposed to hit every muscle every 72 hours. Then if I'm sore for more than a day, to me, that means that I'm cutting into my recovery time. Like, is, is it a correct assumption that you want to be exactly to the point where you would be sore, but not be sore to get the max amount of recovery? Or can you be sore and still recover more than if you were not sore? Soreness plays a role in recovery and it plays a role of like a guide, but not an exact one-to-one -one answer. So for example, okay. if you're consistently sore when you're still trying to train that muscle again, the next session, the right. probability that you're going to very soon exceed your maximum recoverable volume is high. Um, the probability that you'll be able to sustainably survive that program, thus be under your MRV is lower. It's lower. It's not hundred percent and you can cook it for a few weeks and still be okay. Okay. For a variety of reasons, but it's a good start. So I'll put it to you this way. If you're really trying to stay under your MRV, especially at the beginning of a program where you want to be well, well under it, if you are continue, if you're doing so much volume that you're still sore, you train triceps Monday, they're still sore Thursday, you train them Thursday, they'll still sore next Monday. Yeah, you're probably overdoing it. The only way really to be sure is performance. Is MRV recovery is is in, stated in performance terms. You're under under recovered when you can no longer perform at the same level. If you can perform at the same level, you are recovered. If you perform at a higher level, you are both recovered and adapted. And so if you can week after week after week hit the same numbers or higher numbers, you're within your MRV. Even if you're sore all the fucking time, it doesn't matter. But if you're sore all the fucking time, it's not a bad deal. Let, let me let me put it to you another way. You know, let's see one of my drop into my shitty analogies uh, uh, bag. Um, you know, you see two goth girls talking in high school and your question and answer is are they going to be friends tomorrow uh, that's the analogy of mrv and depending on their conversation you can't tell for sure but you can probabilistically estimate so if the conversation is like oh my god mindy i love you okay see you at class bye uh -huh. yeah they're probably gonna be friends tomorrow if the conversation is you literally ruin my life if you ever get next to kevin again i'm gonna stab you to death probability of friendship is lower. But here's the thing about high school kids, right? They'll say shit like that. Then at 8 p.m., they'll text each other. They'll meet up. They'll hug it out. They're like, dude, I was crazy. I'm so sorry. Kevin should never come between us, blah, blah, blah. And they're friends. So you can't tell 100%. But gee whiz, some shit, really, when you say it, you might you might be friends later, but you might not be friends the day after. So the same kind of idea with soreness and, and MRV is like, it's one of the signs, but it is not the final arbiter. The final arbiter is uh, performance. 
are you at or above your typical performance if you are you're within mrv and it doesn't matter how you feel you can feel like total shit and still technically be recovering because you're so close to your margins that you feel awful for example you know if you're fighting if you're flying a fighter plane as fast as possible to shoot the missile lob it over to the other country the shin could be fucking shaking the instruments could be like blipping in and out and 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 you're like oh my god are we past our limits like no motherfucker the plane's still flying you're still below now are you very much below no don't push it any faster because you could die how do you know the plane is beyond its limits structurally when pieces of it start coming off so the same kind of thing with mrv is you'll know when your strength goes down but until it does have at it. So here's here's an interesting implication for that right away. Let's say that you're doing a very high volume training program for the first time. You started at moderate low volumes, you worked up and you just keep going up. You're healing on time from soreness most of the times. And but you're real tired, you're real beat up. But every time you come into the gym, whatever muscle you're increasing, let's say it's delts or something, it just keeps performing about the same or even better than last time. So if you look at your program, and say, are you fucking kidding me? 28 sets of delts this week? The scientific answer back at you would be like, yes, apparently you can recover from that. And you might not want to recover from that. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if every muscle was like the hamstrings where you did like eight total sets per week and that's all the growth you could, that's all the recovery you could ever muster because hamstrings get sore so easily? Yeah, it'd be dope. But sometimes you got to pound these muscles into oblivion. If you're still stronger, than, then, then you're going to go. Another uh, thing is when, when muscles have low MRV. Some people say, dude, I cannot train with more than eight sets of quads per week. I just get weaker like two weeks later or the next week if I do that. And that's real. That's your MRV. Now, you can maybe change it somehow by improving your nutrition, your sleep, blah, 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 you know, all that other stuff. But that seems to be the reality of the matter for you. So it's not up to you what your MRV is in the literal sense of like, it's going to be some kind of number or range and you're just going to have to design your wor workout best around that. Now, like that, that that's real, you know? Um, and uh, it's really, really good insight to know about your body. It's just as good of insight to know things like that about your body. I'd say better than, you know, things to know about a car that you just bought. Like if the guy at the dealership says, look, these tires are great, but in the winter time, especially if it's getting icy and snowy, you should bring them back around. We'll put some tires on. This is something to be like, eh, Fuck them. I hate these snow tires. Like, okay, you want to die? Sweet. Don't put them on. But like the guy just told you, it's probably a good idea to put on the snow tires. Something you want to know about your car. Would it be sweet if your car was capable of like fucking tank driving anywhere? Didn't need gas, could fly, dope. And some people treat their bodies like that, to be completely honest. Like whatever program they start doing, they're like, this is the program. And you're like, are you sure you're going to be able to recover? They're like, man, recovery's for pussies. There's some stupid shit like that. And you're like, yeah, dope, man. Wear it up. So the more you can know about your body, the more you can do at least two things. One, not bitch out when your body's like, dude, you got more. And two, know your limits so that you're not training uh, harder than you can. It's like, uh, I really appreciate the term, uh, the quote, give it 110%, which means give it more than you're usually giving it. But that really is, mis is a misnomer because 100% should be the most you could give. This is mm -hmm. impossible to give 100% at the same time in many metrics. But in some like volume where you just add it up, it is absolutely as easy to go over MRV as it is to overspend your bank account. It doesn't matter what your bank account is. You can overspend your bank account. And it's not a good idea to do. So I guess the real question is MAV, not MEV, because I presume that MAV has a a faster adaptive rate than MRV. Is that correct? That you've yeah. already started to go off the other side of the graph if you've went past MAV and then MRV is somehow already down here. It gets real complicated. The problem with MAV is that we have no detectable, we have no reliable way of continually measuring it. MAV is technically how much muscle you add every half a week at any given okay. volume. And okay. I don't know of a measuring device that can do that. And But we do have suspicions that, so MAV must be above MEV, must MAV. be above your minimum effective volume by logical consistency. And uh, it has to be probably not terribly high above your MRV um, or you could not recover to accomplish it. And thus it would be pointless because it's like something you can't reach. It's It's kind of nonsense to even think about it. Right. So um, somewhere between MEV and MRV is where your MAV is most often going to be found. If you're beginning a mesocycle, you're rotating exercises, your fatigue is really low. Your MAV is going to be probably surprisingly close to your MEV at first. Because if you think about it, if your MAV is, let's say your MEV is 10 sets 
and AV is 15 sets magically somehow. We just know what it is. And then MRV is 20 sets. If you really trained with 15 sets when your MEV was 10, you'd get debilitating soreness that overlaps like crazy into the other days. And we already know from research that debilitating soreness that bad usually costs you some muscle as it's growing your muscle because it takes away from the adaptive resources and puts them into the recovery resources. It's kind of like, um, you know, your idea of cleaning your house is like, first you flip over all the couches and tear up all the pillows and then you get the mop out. Well, fuck man, you had a little bit more cleaning to do before you get back to even baseline clean. So sometimes it, it wouldn't make sense, you know, if someone said, okay, your M M M M MAV is always the midpoint between your MEV and MRV, that would be amazing because you could just find your MEV, find your MRV, and it just always train in the midpoint. But the problem is when you're not adapted to something, it's going to be too shocking. So your MAV is probably closer to MEV when, MEV when you start. And it's as you train more and more and more, you need more and more and more volume to get the same result, to get closer to your best adaptive magnitude and thus at the end of your mesocycle your mav maximum adaptive volume and mrv maximum recovery volume probably get pretty close to each other and so uh what i do is i say you know since we can't find mav directly yet we're just really better off starting around mev for our mesocycles finishing around mrv and that really solves a lot of problems so you just have to be able to detect one and detect the other and go from one to the other so then that brings up the next subcategory which is as someone becomes advanced, they can't really work all their muscles at MAV. Otherwise, it seems like in my case, I might have zero localized fatigue, but yeah. I will have systemic fatigue through the, I won't want to go to the gym. I won't want to sleep. I won't want to eat because I'm just too tired all the time from doing 200 something sets a week. Yeah. So the I think your idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, is pick a couple body parts, maybe one big, one small, work those above MEV, like maybe a, a approximate MAV, and then with the other body parts, work them closer to MV. So you're only trying to grow two things in a mesocycle or in a group of mesocycles. Is that accurate? Is that something that advanced lifters might want to do? Yeah, it's a real good way to think about it. I would say two is a fine answer. But you really have to go and explore to see what your answer is. When you're a beginner, you can train all of your muscle groups and have never even seen your systemic fatigue cap. And you can do this with really hardcore compound full body exercises, deadlift, push presses, crazy shit like that. As an intermediate, you can probably still make the best possible gains or close. Mm -hmm. Take every local muscle to its maximum recover volume within your systemic fatigue cap. But you got to be real serious about nutrition and um a training organization, you probably have to choose much better stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises. Like you're not going to deficit deadlift your way and push press your way into effective training that's within your MRV systemically. If you're an intermediate, in most cases, you'll just break apart into pieces because only beginners can do that. And then once you're an advanced lifter, some number of your muscle groups in any one big pushing phase may have to stay at maintenance volume. Uh, even if you do everything right. And that number increases as you get more advanced and as you age. So uh, sometimes you may be able to just say, let's say we have eight major muscle groups just for shits and giggles. This is something like that. You know, the first time you put two muscles on the back burner, put them to two muscles on a maintenance volume, you may have enough systemic fatigue cap that lets every muscle go to MRV and then you're fucking golden. Uh, after some number of years, it might be four muscles that you have to take off the front burner. And then you can only really go hard, hard on four muscles and the other four muscles have to be maintenance. So you can alternate that every two mesos, no problem, make great gains. And, uh, event eventually it could get up to where it's six and, uh, eventually it may get up to where it's like, well, really you can train one muscle for gains at any one point. I've never seen that happen in real life, but I have seen people get to three or four pretty reliably. So, and this is especially true if you have constraint on the number of days you can train, which is a big deal. Because like, if you have four training days per week, once you get big and strong enough and advanced enough, you cannot do eight hard exercises in one day. It's bullshit. After the first four or five, it's all junk volume at the end of that shit. Like, what does your biceps training look like after six sets of quads and, and, and two sets of hamstrings? And that's just uh, two exercises. 
Like, wait a minute, hold on. No, no, do three more exercises. Something for back, something for chest, something for shoulders. Okay, now go do biceps. You're like, what the fuck? You're so systemically fatigued by that point. You're like, this is pointless. So if you train only three or four days a week, then you as an intermediate may, ha may start having to do some muscles at MAV-ish, between MAV and MRV, and some muscles at maintenance volume. Now, the real silver lining to this is twofold. We have good literature now showing that if systemic fatigue isn't limiting, the local MRVs are really, really high. So you can actually benefit from just smashing a muscle into bits if you slowly work up to it in many cases and just keep getting gains. It's fucking great. The other good news is that because roughly a third-ish, probably at most for most people, maybe even less, of your uh, MAV estimate is going to be somewhere like your MV, it's really quite easy to put muscles on the back burner. It's not true to say something like, okay, for gains, I have to do uh, 20 sets per week of biceps, but to maintain them, I got to do 18. Like if it's 20 for gains, it's like six to maintain. Now, six sets of biceps a week is a very different conversation than 20. It's so different than 12. It's so different than 10. And you can probably scoot it in there, no problem whatsoever. And in most cases, unless you're fat loss dieting, you can even do all those sets in one day of the week. So you can have four-day plan where you train all of your important muscle groups at the first part of each four days. And then the last exercise, maybe, or last two exercises of each one of those four-day sessions is like two, one or two muscles that you have on maintenance. And you do two to four sets of them twice a week. And that's it. They're never shrinking. And that's really awesome because that means you don't have to train like a psychopath eight fucking hours a day, split it into 12 sessions. You can train relatively normally. Your gains will be slower, but they'll be consistent. And I do want to point out something very, very important here. The alternative to not recognizing this is that you actually get no gains at all. So if you have a situation where all of your muscles, if you train them hard, they can't even get to close to their MEVs. They're in that gray zone between maintenance volume and minimum effective volume. If you don't specialize and put some muscles on the front burner, some on the back burner, you actually make no gains in your overall muscles. Um, and that's really, really bad news because you you can't kind of can't do it all at the same time. Conversely, you can be in a situation where if you're not taking enough muscles off the, the front burner and putting them on the back burner, the very muscles you struggle with most because you have to train them in a full body context can be very close to MEV on average through your program. Sometimes maintenance volume towards the end of a program, they make a few gains. And then it's like, you get really, really, really disappointing gains all the time, especially in the muscles you need to bring up. So especially if you're in a place with your physique where your some of your muscles have to get bigger, then you're really, really, really incentivized to massively cut the volume of some of the other muscles, especially ones that are really systemically fatiguing legs and back, for example. If you need bigger arms, you can train maintenance legs, maintenance back, and fucking just annihilate your arms, and it almost certainly will get you very, very good gains. Whereas if you're still trying to train legs and back hard and trying to bring up your arms, you may see no notable arm growth in months and months and months and months and months of training, which is like a lot of people, and I've done that a whole bunch, and it's really dumb because of failure to understand that. It's it's like, what's the tool for the job? Is it, do, do we, how much bandwidth do we need to train this muscle? And then we make room for it. You know, like if you want to buy a pickup truck, it's not the same thing as buying a Corvette. And if you say, well, they're both cars, like, okay, sweet. Put some fucking coal into the back of this Corvette. And you're like, ah, fuck the wrong tool for the job. So specialization is a very good tool when the job is necessary. The thing is a lot of beginners think they need it and they don't. So you see someone who's training for six months, like, yeah, man, emphasizing biceps and delts, this metal cycle, like, dude, shut the fuck up. Just do whole body training. You'll get the best gains you've ever gotten all over. But uh, for advanced folks, it would be awesome if the uh, the process of training still got you all over gains, but it doesn't anymore. And you have to recognize that. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much you hit the nail on the head for me as I've been trying to bring up my arms my whole time, but I've always been doing them pretty much behind chest or back, except for on the periods that I made any progress with my arms when I gave them their specific day. So what I started doing is putting biceps before legs one and triceps before legs two, rather than giving an arm day. Yeah, okay. And I find that the amount of fatigue I accumulate from doing arms first doesn't really affect the legs. And then I flipped it just to see, and I really don't see a decrease in performance in biceps if I do quads and hams first. 
but what I did try to do is bring up quads, like legs, back, arms, and middle delts for the last three years. And if there's any changes, I don't see it because it was so slow in all four areas. But yeah. the actual performance technically went up, although I'm not as phys- I'm not handling the same weight as I was. So, and that's the part that's confusing is you'd think that if you're handling less weight, you're less strong. But then that gets into the whole thing about slow eccentrics, which confuses matters further. And that whether or not you have to actually do heavy weight for low reps to get the best gains versus high reps. So, for example, there is a very popular influencer who um, is not you. And he feels that if you do anything like 12 reps, it's inferior than doing six reps. And I know that we're working under the assumption. um, Well, he doesn't want me saying his name because I said I was going to be talking to you. And he doesn't want me dropping his name. But uh, So is it Paul Carter? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to try to have him on first, but he canceled on me. So I could give him a chance to get his point across better. But he feels that that if you go 12 reps, you start accumulating so much fatigue that when you try to do lower rep, higher weight sets, that you're going to get interference with the two X fighters and that you pretty much have to stay under eight. And I looked at the Menmo Henselman did a um, review of like three different studies. And on one of the charts it showed that the two X fibers seem to kick in around eight reps in reserve so in theory if you were to do your eight rep max or more which is about 80 percent of your one rep max then every single rep fires those two x fibers so that reps in reserve no longer matters in theory once you lift heavy enough every rep's effective rep but i guess this premise that as you get a pump as you get closer to failure as you take sets to failure you get calcium ions accumulating in the sarcomere and then the calcium ions bind to the myoactazin filaments and that prevents the cross bridging and that you no longer are able to activate the white fibers and that that's why leg extensions before squats is no longer effective you have to do squats before leg extensions of course this doesn't account for the fact that in many of us squats are a glute exercise and then leg extensions are quad exercise. And if you don't do quad leg extensions before squats, you won't actually get quad dominant growth. You'll get more bigger glutes than you like you increase the gap between the glutes and the quads if you do squats first. So I guess I rambled a little bit and mixed in a lot of stuff, but what's your response to this whole thing that 12 reps are useless? You have to do six reps. I have a few responses to that. One is that the direct literature seems to show that people get roughly the same amount of growth anywhere between about five reps and 30 reps per set. There have been enough studies on that to make that no longer controversial. So that someone saying that you shouldn't do more than 12 reps per set should be operating under the assumption that there's not a direct way that they're correct. But there can be other ways. There's the idea that sets of 12 reps or above provide just as much stimulus and thus growth in the medium term as lower reps sets, but they're also fatiguing excessively, much more so per their unit of stimulus than those lower reps sets, which basically means their stimulus to fatigue ratio is lower and thus not worthwhile. And that might even be true on some metrics. It doesn't take all metrics into account with fatigue. A very important metric of fatigue is joint and connective tissue integrity and joint connective connective tissue fatigue. And so while it is true that sets of 12, 15 or more reps may be uh, acutely more fatiguing, it is twelve or fifteen are acutely more fatiguing. Oh, you teleported out. Um <laughs> It's so it can be true that sets of 12 or 15 reps are more fatiguing um, in the sense of they make you feel more tired or they decrease future set performance more so 
in some given time frame, say a few minutes or something like that. But sets of 15 and fewer reps, 5 to 15, many people would report exact a heavier toll on the joints and connective tissues. They certainly have a, an acute injury risk that's higher at any time, any time you lift them. And for anyone who's gotten big and strong, they've mostly realized that for some movements, a lot of movements perhaps, sets of 5 to 10 reps are very effective, but also will fuck you up and uh, tax your joints like crazy. So for example, if you have someone who's been training a long time, I say, build me an effective leg session that doesn't produce a crap load of fatigue more than stimulus. You say, you have to use the leg press. It's unlikely they're going to be doing sets of six or seven in the leg press. It's more likely that they're going to be doing sets of 10 to 15, 15 to 20, because it fucks the muscles up in that range, which is great, but it doesn't really fuck up the joints. Where a sets of six or seven on leg press, man, I got to make sure my back position is real good. And my knees feel real good. I don't warm up a lot. And after weeks and weeks and weeks of sets of six or seven, I might find that my joints are really not feeling good because it uh, the, the load there is a big deal. And there is a special kind of systemic fatigue that occurs in my experience and many others experience from lifting heavy weights for high volume. It's a little bit different than light weights. Light weights are more fatiguing acutely, approximately, like at the time in which you do them, five, 20 minutes after you're real fucked up. But then like two, three, four hours later, like, yeah, you feel pretty good. Locally, you're really tired, but systemically you feel okay. Whereas if you do lots of sets of six to eight close to failure, it's a real deep kind of systemic fatigue that follows you around sometimes for days. And so in the real world, it's not convincing to me at face value that sets of five to 15, let's call them, are categorically less fatiguing over realistic timescales than sets of 15 to 30 reps. There's more. It's very individual dependent and very muscle dependent. Some people do a set of five on biceps and be like, that just hurts my elbow. Some people do, same people do a set of 20 on biceps and like, I've, this is the pump of my life. I've never felt my biceps like this. Some people do a set of 20 on biceps and they're like, I'm just tired. This is stupid. Uh, and then some people do a set of, uh, five on biceps and they're like, dude, the fucking tension was gnarly. My muscle connections out of this world and my joints feel great. So what I encourage people to do is try all three repetition ranges and for various muscles on various machines and exercises at various points in your mental cycles and kind of try to heuristically kind of examine which one is giving me like really good stimulus and seemingly less fatigue. The good stimulus is judged by like, am I feeling the burn? Am I feeling the tension? How are the pumps? Do I get sore for multiple days after? And fatigue is like, does it fuck me up systemically? Am I tired? Do I hate this exercise? Do I not want to do it? Does it feel like it tires me out for days after or minutes after for sure? And how is it, how is it dealing with my joints? Because if I say to you, look, you're going to grow your squats with low, with you're going to grow your quads with low bar squats versus you're going to grow your quads, you know, so let's say in sets of five versus you're going to grow your quads with sets of 15 in a well-designed leg press machine, one of those is going to be more stimulative and less fatiguing. And it is not the low bar squats for sets of five. So you have to play around and see where is your best result. And people are very different and people can run the gamut all the way to preferring sets of five to 10 mostly, and all the way up to preferring sets of 20 to 30 mostly. There are people that like that. A lot of pro bodybuilders love those higher rep ranges. And uh, so that's kind of the, the, the whole spectrum there is I think that TLDR, the joint and connective tissue fatigue, is being missed out on uh, for if you're really intending on just always going sets of 6 to 12. And I know very many champion bodybuilders that sure tried to train like that when they were younger and they started falling apart. And they had the bright idea to guess, let's see how 15 sets of 15 to 20 goes. And then they're like, oh, my fucking God, why the hell have I not been doing this my entire career? And, uh, and vice versa. That's pretty much exactly where I was at. What was my counter arguments where you're accounting for metabolic fatigue, but not for CNS fatigue or joint fatigue. So you've accounted for, and then furthermore, I've double tested this. I've changed the exercise order around the past couple of weeks. And like if I did, I think I did 16 sets and I was getting 12 reps for the first set, 10 reps for the second rep set. And these were to failure just to test it out. See how many calcium ions can I accumulate? And then for the next 10 sets of lats, I was nine reps. So it was nine reps, nine reps, nine reps, nine reps, nine reps. This did not lose performance. Mm -hmm. So if you were to work under the assumption that it's not the last 
eight reps that are effective reps. It's the first eight reps that are effective, the top eight reps. So let's say that 12 reps had eight effective reps. And then 11 reps only had seven effective reps. And 10 reps, nine reps had five effective reps. I was still getting five effective reps for the next 10 sets. So, because there's, you know, like, I think in what you've discussed is that if you do, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the few reps or the effective rep. But I'm, th I think like if you, let's say you got 20 reps and you failed at 20 and your next set was 12 reps. To me, that doesn't make sense that they have the same amount of effective reps. Cause I think that what you've done is you've lost a lot of those effective reps because you're significantly more fatigued that perhaps those type two fibers aren't kicking in anymore. So you're only getting two B fibers, or two A. Fibers. And then eventually you're down to just working those white fibers and you lose the pump. And I know that there's, I don't have any science. It's just philosophy at this point, but if you're going from 12 reps to 10 reps to nine reps, and you're staying at nine reps for eight or nine sets, you're obviously not getting progressive fatigue that the first couple sets you lost a lot of energy, but on the rest of them, you didn't get more fatigued. Do you have any uh, opinion about that? Yeah. The effective reps model is almost certainly not as extreme as when it was originally introduced in reality. So it's true to say that getting close to failure probably makes your reps a little bit more effective than not, but it's probably not true by a lot. So the effective reps model of the last five reps are the ones that do all the growing is probably not true. And it's probably true to say that in any one given set, if you get more reps, it's just more stimulus. So if we take a set of 12 and we compare it three minutes later to a set of nine, the set of 12 almost certainly grows more muscle than the set of nine. There's not really much way to get around that. But there are two ways to incorporate that and still get as many gains as you want or you're capable of getting one way is just rest longer i mean you rest for five to eight minutes after a set of 12 you're probably getting a set of 12 again and you could just keep doing that but if you don't have forever time in the gym you can do set of 12 set of eight set of seven set of six set of six set of five and just because the reps accumulate to a certain total number of reps you're getting very similar hypertrophy to what you would be if you did the same total number of reps, but with longer breaks between sets and thus fewer sets. So as long as you're training in the five to 30 rep range, as long as most of your sets come close to failure, the total number of reps that you do over the workout probably correlates more to how much growth you get than the total number of sets. So if you're resting a little too short, just do more sets. If you're resting a long time, you won't have to do as many sets just to get to the same number of total reps for that workout. So then using your myo reps model, not my rather model. than we'll say, oh, I thought it was your I it reps was no. something you came up with. No, no, oh, absolutely okay. not. No, that's Berge Fagrelli from uh where is he from? Norway, I think. Uh that's who came okay. up with the model. So I didn't come up with straight sets okay. either, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so 12 reps plus say six mini sets of five. You rest just long enough to get five reps. Yeah. Ends of 42 reps. Yeah. One could also do 12 reps, wait two minutes, 10 reps, wait, yeah. it's eight reps, wait two minutes, and then get 12 more reps, three, three minutes, get 12 more reps. That 42 equates to the same 42 that we just had. So, like Hani Roughly. Rambod's FST7, we got 80, you got 12 reps with a sub maximal load wait 30 seconds, 12 reps, wait 30 seconds. You ended up getting 84 reps with a pounds. And so it's it doesn't really matter. That's Messelman just did a video about this recently. If we know it doesn't matter much, we don't know if it doesn't matter mm -hmm. at all. It matters so little that we can't tell the trading methods apart in the literature, so we can't make any further strong conclusions about it. Also, with the Hani Rambod thing, I don't know if those sets are close to failure or not. I'm just, I have no idea if that's the case. I, if I that think, is the case, I think, yeah, it's not, I, I think be, this is why I think that's a model, and this is my experience with it. And I 
is 2011. The first couple sets are easy because you're not supposed to change the weight. You're not supposed to de decrease it in T7 where you're hitting failure and then reduce the weight failure, reduce the weight failure. Eventually, you're just doing cardio with it because you've both gotten below the 30% threshold, right? So if it's a set of 12 right there, boom, that's 65% of your one rep max. So if your total load gets down to 50%, now you're at 32% one of your one rep that's too close to the minimum effective load to be effective. So usually if you don't start light, you won't finish strong. And if you start strong, you finish so light that you lose it. But with the Meyer rep model, it works much better than a cluster set or an FSC seven, which is another name for a cluster set is you take a set near failure, rest five rep or failure, rest five reps, and I always count those myo sets as whole sets. But really, mm -hmm. if you were to compare straight sets to the myo sets, the straight set trumps the myo set because it's eight to 12 reps, not five reps. But if we're just accumulating a total number of reps, that it now it basically it ends up being two myo rep sets is equivalent to one straight set. But you get it done in less time. Yeah, that's the big thing. Uh, it seems roughly equivalent on a rep equated model, but you do get to do it in less time. And so a lot of people will interpret research literature by seeing a title of a study or maybe reading the abstract and they get the, kind of the wrong conclusion from it. People say, you know, insufficient rest time impairs growth, but the citation will be in a set controlled model. So if you're only able, if you're only allowed to do five sets and you do them all too quick, the, the repetition result or the load you have to use is going to be so unimpressive that you're going to kind of fuck yourself and you're just not going to get as jacked than as if you took longer enough time to rest. But if you equate for total time spent in the gym, then things like my reps and supersets and drop sets start to look really, really good because you can get, oh, disappointingly, the same stimulus but in half the time in many cases. And if that's the case, then we just found out a way to get really great results in a fraction of the time. That's amazing for regular folks that aren't trying to turn pro or some shit like that. But it's also really, really good for people who are uh, very much pro or near pro bodybuilders or you know top amateurs because time, extra time spent literally in the gym is time you could have spent uh, relaxing and playing PlayStation and having food. And so, you know, the gym's not exactly like a stress relief place to be. It relieves your stress if you're a regular person by letting you work out. But, you know, I'd much rather when I get in the gym, I don't want to push myself any faster than makes my muscles no longer the targets, but my cardio is the target now or it overstresses me. But if I can crunch out a little bit of downtime in the gym versus sitting between my fucking sitting on my phone for five minutes between each set, if I can sit on my phone for two minutes between each set, and get out of the gym faster, do a couple extra sets and get the same growth anyway. Hey man, I'm there. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Fusion Regenerative Therapies, where I am the director of human performance. This is the practice in which I practice medicine. Uh, we will be able to order you blood work and read your blood work and help you with therapy as needed based upon the results of your blood work. Please click the link to get a consult with me and I can help you optimize your performance. Thank you. So that kind of brings up another point is, I would definitely get a better pump if I took one minute rest, just three minute rest. So then there's the question about fit wash out like how fast do these calcium ions disappear and or how much does metabolic um contaminants if you will perpetuate help facilitate growth i believe in your advanced video lectures you discussed that if you take reps above 25 you might much jump in the synaptic cleft that the acetyl and bind to the tinnic receptors so you don't get as much neuromuscular excitation of the muscle fibers so that a little bit less mechanical tension capacity that's not just irregardless of the, or regardless of the load being you're not tracting hard when you go over 20 25 reps so but you get more metabolic drive now of course 
the aforementioned influencer says that metabolic drive has no effect on hypertrophy, that the correlation between metabolites and hypertrophy is because the metabolites are the byproduct of the, of the stimulus driven by mechanical tension. So like the pump is correlated with growth because it is a proxy for stimulus. The metabolites are correlated with growth because they're a proxy for stimulus. But I believe in the past you've postulated that the metabolites themselves drive growth. And in my personal opinion, it just makes sense that if you stretch the muscle, it's going to make the muscle bigger and allow it to get bigger. And that if you don't ever get a pump, then also you're more likely to get injured and you will have this type of hydro force in the actual muscle fiber as if it was a greater diameter from the hydraulics from the pump actually facilitate the mechanical tension capacity on subsequent sets. So I don't know if you picked out a question out of that blithering. I guess my question is, um, how valuable do you think the metabolic drive for hypertrophy is? especially in the context of doing myo reps as opposed to straight sets. I'm not sure we have at least two metabolites, lactate and phosphatidic acid that have direct animal evidence for mechanistic hypertrophy improvement. So they actually do, do seem to trigger muscle growth in animal models. You know, animals have something like 90 or 95% uh identical muscle physiology as humans which means they're something uh, could be different but um it's not just purely speculation so it could be that tension is the only thing that muscles sense for hypertrophy we already know that can't really we, we already know that that's not ultra likely because your muscles also sense food availability and androgen availability in their hypertrophic trigger triggers. So they're, they're totally capable. There are parts of your muscle totally capable of sensing molecule density, just various types of molecules and seeing whether or not that actually triggers uh, hypertrophy. And so we, the idea that it has to only be tension is a, a hypothesis, um, but stated as a confidently is confusing because not only are there candidates and animal models for these metabolites, there is no at face value reason to rule out metabolites. Um, so people who say it can't be metabolites or it's not metabolites definitely have no convincing evidence to that effect. And I would just say kind of want to oversimplify for its own sake. And it's a fine hypothesis to say, I don't think that metabolites muster, you know, this sort of meat muster, they don't add up to anything. I don't know what logical reasoning you'd be making uh, that uh, assumption on. And I would say for now, we just need, need more research, but because pushing hard in training correlates so well to generating metabolites, uh, there's not really a reason for us to say, well, the metabolite training is just stupid. Don't do it. Well, if I take a set to failure for 28 total reps, Science already tells me it's going to grow me about as much as any other set taken to failure. And I don't give a fuck if that happens with some aided tension or metabolites or a pump or some combination of all three. By the way, we also do have evidence that cell swelling causes hypertrophy. So oh, good. Um, I've had yeah. smart people tell me I was dumb for thinking that. So yeah, that's okay. Uh, they just have good. Google studies for like 2010 <laughs> or something. And I would question how just, smart those people are, by the way. <laughs> it, it's just, it just blows my mind because it's like, all right, man. So every Mr. Olympia is wrong. And then they always say, well, that's that just because they're genetically gifted. They might I was be like, right. okay, so they're all genetically gifted and they're all doing it wrong. That well, we already that know, Todd, that they're all genetically gifted. That we don't have to assume. <laughs> could they all be doing it wrong? Yeah, they all could be doing it wrong, man. They could be doing it wrong. How many Mr. Well, Olympia have you met? Are, but a couple. But like Occam's They seem like real, the that. smartest people in the room to you. That's not fair because I know smart as fuck people and I have my whole life, right? But so the Olympians could I be wrong. <laughs> they could all be wrong. I think uh, statistically speaking, some of them would be onto something at some point. 
Definitely, definitely. But then again, yeah. because high reps cause a lot of tension and metabolites, maybe the metabolites really just have nothing to do with growth. And maybe the pump is just something that makes us feel nice, but it also has nothing to do with growth. Maybe it's a proxy for when you have a good workout, but not a causative mechanism by which growth happens. That, that could totally be just, um, there's no reason to suspect it if you're trying to stay. A lot of people in the fitness industry try to make really categorical claims that seem to have more insight about what it is they're talking about than they really do. Uh, for example, folks that came up with, maybe not even the ones came up with, that really touted the effective reps model made the claim that it's the last, whatever, let's say five reps that are effective and all the other ones are ineffective. I mean, we know now that they were wrong, but there was no reason for them to make that claim. It was obnoxiously specific. Uh, yeah. We just didn't have confirmed uh, evidence that the first some number of reps of a training session weren't hypertrophic. Now, they could postulate that they're less hypertrophic, and that's a very good hypothesis. But very different than just saying outright, well, no, 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 no. It's, it's just the last five. A lot of people got on that bandwagon um, and they were looking at evidence and reason that most of us exercise scientists who actually publish in the field just hadn't seen. Like, how do you know? It's the only it's the only five. It's, I haven't seen a lot of convincing. There's like three studies at the time that said, yeah, the closer failure you go, the better. And that's what that's what they used. And the rest was mathematical modeling, which you can, with wrong assumptions, you can get wrong answers out of that, no problem. And then so the idea that tension is the only mediator of growth is, again, an interesting hypothesis. Um, it has some parsimony in the sense that if you just assume it's only tension, things make some sense. You can explain much of the variance. But can you rule out the fact that metabolites and the pump are also causative of hypertrophy in their own right, maybe at a smaller scale? No, you can't rule that out. And people just uh, who try to rule it out, I think are in the business of pretending that it doesn't matter. Uh, and that's weird. So something you put forward, I noticed a long time ago, was the second feels better than the first set. And if yeah. this model is correct, that any amount of work, some fatigue in calcium ions and decreases my um, contractivity of the muscle, then we have a better mind-muscle function on the second set or the third set. Like, yeah, the full set of belt squats, I'm only getting seven reps instead of 12 or 15. But every one of those reps, I feel in the hard to reach place where I have yep. no mind muscle action on the first set. But first set of belt squat, it's all knees and ankles and hips. And yeah. by the fourth set, it's all lateral quads, which is the hardest to reach part on my quad. So maybe other people have very responsible quads, but I do not. So the muscle I'm trying to hit doesn't get hit unless I do leg extensions first, or I do six sets of belt squats. So I don't understand these extremely draconian, heavy-handed theories that these people have, that it's like, we studied these 12, 20-year-old kids who've never lifted before, so therefore all the Mr. Olympias are wrong about how they train. It doesn't make sense to me. It's worse than that, because they're citing only one of the studies that are on 20-year-olds and excluding five other studies. That's real bad news. The way I like to think of training is the cup filling model. You have a cup <laughs> and in it, pour effort in to get growth. Mm -hmm. But the kind mm -hmm. of effort you pour in might fill the cup faster, but you still need plenty of effort to fill the cup. So while the set of five at the end of your belt squat sets may not be causing as much hypertrophy as the first set of 12, it does fill the lineup more and more and more. So if you have this much cup to fill, one set of 12 might fill it to here, but you need another couple sets to fill it all the way to the end. You got to fill it up anyway. So I think some people uh, may be in the business of pretending that if you wait longer, then you'll be able to fill the cup in fewer sets. It's true, but if you can fill the cup just as well in more sets, but not wait as long, that could be a fine idea as well. And uh, the other thing is how you're filling the cup with what quality of contents matters over the long term. If you're filling your cup with only hypertrophic stimulus, let's put it the extreme. Let's say you're only doing sets of three heavy, sets of three with a four rep max. Mm -hmm. You can fill up the cup with sets of three. It's just going to take you like 20 sets. And someone can say, look, that's this, the same cup filling as it would take for four sets of, you know, 10 to 20 reps, normal conventional training. And you say, yeah. See, I'm doing it just the same, but we already know from direct studies and really don't need to rely on direct studies much for this. If you've ever lifted weights for longer than about a month, you realize this, that if you're trying to get to high volumes, sets of three at that high of a load, you're going to fall apart into fucking pieces sooner or later. So what matters is multiple sets 
of any kind of modality fill up the cup. It's up to you to decide which is the best stimulus to fatigue ratio, modality, exercise, et cetera, that fills up the cup in a way that causes the least amount of fatigue. And that means that you have to be open-minded for sets of five to 10, sets of 10 to 20, and sets of 20 to 30, depending on the context. Here's a context for sets of 20 to 30. We do two leg days a week, and the first one is harder and heavier, it works great. But by the second leg day, your muscles are recovered, but your joints don't feel fucking right, man. They just don't. Your knees and hips feel fucking weird. If you try to do another set of another workout of sets of 10 to 20 reps, you tried that for a few weeks and then you got like knee and hip pain so, so much that you couldn't even train the heavy days anymore. Like, okay, that doesn't fucking work. Then what do you do? You try sets of 20 to 30 on that second workout, leg extensions, you know, sissy squats, shit like that. And you're like, dude, not only do I get a gnarly fucking pump burn, blah, 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 all the things that do correlate to growth anyway, and clearly I'm growing it. And all the studies say 20 to 30 is great for growth, but now I can do this and my knees don't get fucked up at all. As a matter of fact, the higher reps get my knees so much blood flow and so much warmth, it's kind of rehab in the middle of the week. And so by the next week, when it's time to go heavy again, my knees feel even better than if I didn't do anything. And I get two hypertrophy sessions. If you were to take that whole situation and say, nah, nah, sets of 20 to 30 are stupid and they never cause growth, you're just missing out on a real world tactic that's fucking super effective. You know, like that's it it's like someone tells you like the only kind of engine to have is a v8 like yeah what if i need to get in a honda civic and go to kroger and back and get some fucking groceries do i really need a v8 they're like well um no there's no there's no answer to that that's not you know, no you do not always need a v8 and some people really really like lifting heavy some people are also just not don't have enough manhood to lift for high reps because lifting for high reps is fucking hard and it g- gasses you out and you might not enjoy it, that does not mean that it is ineffective. And you could say, I don't like it, and then you could do less of it. But sometimes it's strategically viable, and thus uh, a really good thing to have in your arsenal. It's very hard to have perfect near failure if you're going heavier than 8 to 12 to 10 reps anyway. Like you end up having a winging scapula, you end up having knee wonkiness, that if you're going super, you're almost like, First rep looks like shit. So obviously at the end of the set, like shit. <laughs> so again, how much mechanical tension is that muscle really experiencing when shooting seven other muscles to help carry the load? It's um it just doesn't make sense to me. So the last two things I have on here are more like it's so esoteric that it may not be valuable, but my hypothesis is the reason why the eccentric studies show greater hypertrophy with slow eccentrics because there's been people who've equated one second with three second eccentrics as being the same and last time you and me talked it was three seconds eight seconds doesn't make a difference as long as your set's controlled but i noticed that you and jared train or when you have people on your show they're usually doing very slow eccentrics and isn't the studies about Eccentric training really about this eccentrically overloaded, like someone helps you get it up through the concentric and then fight it on the eccentric. And the reason why the eccentric training is superior is because it's more mechanical tension than one would normally. So there are two different kinds of studies. One is studies that tr- that change tempo. They'll change eccentric tempo from two seconds to six seconds, for example. Those do not involve uh, overloading the eccentric. The uh, studies that do involve it involve it are usually termed um, EAL studies, uh, eccentric accentuated overload, uh, or ex- eccentric accentuated loading, EAL. And some of those studies do have the uh, accentuated eccentric with higher loads, but those are not the ones I'm referring to when we're talking about purely tempo. It's also, okay. last I looked at the literature, it's still true to say that any eccentric under control is about as good for short-term, medium-term growth as any eccentric speed, even if it's okay. much slower. And the reason that Jared and I often both ourselves lift and coach many people in a slower eccentric style is a couple of reasons. One, any given slower eccentric speed, uh, in my view, categorically reduces the injury risk because injury is a multiple right. of force and velocity. You put high forces, high velocities together, your multiple your chance of getting hurt is much higher. If you manage to reduce the velocity, seemingly according to studies, you still get the same growth, but now your risk of injury is much better. Hey, hey, I'll take it. another thing is very small differences in growth can occur. 
you know, some people who really start to get a really awesome technique with their exercise and great mind muscle connection, a little bit of growth, more growth can occur for them than if they had done the exercise, just kind of like going through the motions. That's definitely a thing. It's not right. a big deal. It's not going to be picked up in studies and undergraduates, but it's a real enough thing for us who lift weights for a long time to know that it's a real thing. You know, you've done leg press is the old fashioned way. Then you tried kind of the better technique way. And you're like, okay, this one clearly just doesn't hurt my joints as much. And I can use less weight and it fucks me up really, really bad. So if that's the case, then oftentimes slower eccentrics allow you to have more time during a rep to hit the right positioning. So let's take a squat as an example. If you have a one second eccentric, bro, what, whichever way you point your ass, that's the way the squat's going. If it's back a little too far and your quads don't feel it much, if it's too far forward and you get up on your, and your toes by accident, it's not up to you really. Right. One second eccentric. Are you still there? You good? Yeah, I'm here. One second eccentric is like, it's just like one shot, one kill. Like you just, as soon as the bullet's out of the chamber, you're going to find out where it hits if you look up and see the target. But with a three, four, five second eccentric, you can actually correct your movement on the way down. So if you start squatting down, but you feel like, ooh, I'm not squatting into my quads, you can squat a little bit more forward as you continue to go down. But if you notice it's kind of too much force on your knees because you're too high on your toes, you can sink it back. And so every rep is an opportunity to correct itself. And between reps, you can definitely like, you're like, ooh, I'm, I'm getting every rep gets better. And so slow eccentrics basically offer you an ability to upgrade your technique with no downside. The only downside is you get fewer repetitions than you would if you rush the eccentrics, which again, isn't bad, but is a little bit more injury risky. And if you're having trouble with the technique and my muscle connection, it's inferior. So when Jared and I, um, we coach beginners and stuff and we try to get them to slow down their eccentrics, that's not because we're saying they're going to get more growth. It's just to get an opportunity to fix their Ooh. movements while they're doing them. And it's just a better learning tool. You ever have a gymnastics coach, like take a bunch of six-year-olds and go, all right, ladies, here's the double, triple somersault. Boom, 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 boom. And he's like, all right, you go. <laughs> what the fuck? And if he somehow <laughs> slows it down, they're like, oh, I see you tuck your legs here, right? Same idea. And then the other reason is for a completely different population for bigger and stronger folks is like, look, man, if I'm fucking Nick Walker, right? Uh, and I fucking have to have nine plates on a fucking leg press to get my quads to grow. I don't want them shits falling down on me fast, bro. Fuck that. I got to step on the Olympia in three fucking months. Fuck that. Mm -hmm. I want to go down nice and slow. If it's not costing me growth, is it, fellas? Everyone's like, nope, seems to be the same. Sweet. I'm going to go down nice and slow so that I don't get hurt. Uh, and if I do get hurt going down nice and slow, when the fucking shit happens, I wasn't, I was, it was, it was, it was coming one way or another. So it, it, where there's, there are variables involved here that people don't examine. Like, for example, if you have to go to the grocery store, it's 10 minutes away from your house. Typically you can leave 10 minutes before you get there and drive at a normal speed, or you can potentially even leave five minutes before and fucking crank that V8 and go fucking 90 miles an hour on, on fucking side streets where your neighbors live. You will get to the store at the same time, but some of the cost may be discovered in poor fuel consumption. Something as banal as that, um, beating up your car more, you know, like a fucking eight cylinder only has as many fucking cranks in it as something you crank it a lot. It fucking breaks you more wear and tear, more oil replacement, more mechanics looking at it. So you're looking at costs that are unseen. Yeah. You got to the source the same time. You got all these costs. Never mind the cost of like, what if you fucking veer off the road and hit a fucking tree at 40 miles an hour? You're probably not going to do that at 80 on a fucking residential road. Yeah. You might do that shit. And then not only can you fucking hurt somebody else, you can hurt yourself. And so if your people are saying, well, look on the studies, it doesn't matter if it's a one second eccentric or an eight second eccentric. I totally agree with that. But in the real world, you're not just one subject or one study for one time. You're a real human being. You got to take care of yourself and you got to make your best probabilistic decisions going forward. So for us, if you want to do slower, faster eccentrics, hey, fucking rock on. Some for some exercises I do. Todd, I get shit on my own page, bro. I'm on my Instagram page doing some movement that I'm technically really good at. And you know, sometimes it just feels better to kind of rock through it. Like the, you're feeling the eccentrics, but you're fucking going. Uh, and remember, the literature says it grows just the same amount of muscle. I'll have guys be like, that's not really a slow eccentric though. Is it Dr. Mike? And I'm like, motherfucker, where did I, suppose, where did I say you're supposed to be doing slow eccentrics? And then that's when they put the dots together, two wrong dots. I'm like, But in your videos, the, you got people, blah, blah, but that's for those two other reasons. And it's, it's context right. dependent. So I'll, I'll put it this way. If you can't think of a reason to do slow eccentrics and you've worked through the, the mindset there, fuck them. Fast eccentrics. I do them all the time at a bunch of different exercises. If you have a compelling reason to slow down your eccentrics, hey, I wouldn't just say fuck them. I wouldn't just say fuck, whatever, do fast eccentrics. Uh, you're in the game for a long time. You got to think about joint connective tissue health. You got to think about probability of injury. And you have to think about what, what of these pacing models, what, what of these tempos allows me to have my best technique. 
And because if you like, if you do quick skull crusher, someone's like, dude, how, how did you feel? You're up. Like, I don't know, man. I just kind of started and then I ended. It was fucking one blur. My elbows kind of hurt. I don't know why. But if you slowed them down, you might be like, oh shit, every rep, it's feeling fucking great. And then your friend is like, how was it? You're like, just fucking awesome. And he's like, no elbow anything. You're like, no, I feel amazing. I had a little elbow pain on the second rep, but I realized I wasn't pushing my elbows down far enough. Like you could make those corrections if it's slower. Right. If you don't need them, fuck it, go fast. So that's kind that's, of my, you know, that whole thing. I feel a lot better about that because. I, since the last four years, since the last time we talked about it, I didn't really understand it. So I've been d deep diving, but the whole time I pretty much, there was a phase where I was going way too fucking slow and sure. I was doing four seconds. And yeah. I went from like 455 pound squats down to 135 pound squats. Yeah. And I feel that it was counterproductive. I lost muscle that way. Totally. I, well, below 30% one RM or whatever. Yeah. Kind of like what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah. That was before I learned that rule. So it was what I found was on the first couple of reps, I'll go slow and I'll feel out like, how do I load the muscle? I'm trying to load in the stretch position. And then near the end of the, now that I've got a pump and I've got to grind my, my, create my muscle connection going, my tempo loosens up a little bit. My form's just as strict, but yeah. I'll sink it into the stretch, hold yeah. the stretch, explode out. I know you don't like the squeeze trick contraction or the squeeze contraction at the top as much that it's less prone to hypertrophy but for some reason i mean even like this is like even though nick walker went through the training with you and jerry he still also does those squeezes in the contracted position and i almost feel like it's for completeness sake which brings me to my next point but i'll get to that it's like so after this conversation better about going slower for the first couple reps yeah. feeling it out and then as you're getting through it if the thing is lazy you have the mind muscle connection you don't need to force a slow eccentric to feel it as long as you're controlled i always say people red light green light if i can say red light and you can't stop mid eccentric you're not under control you're basically yeah. just dropping the weight slowly. Yeah. But if I can say red light and you can dead stop it, you're under enough control. Sure. So when sure. I, I was about how the top half of the rep is less important than the bottom half of the rep, and that I still do the squeeze at the top half of the rep on most lifts, and that that comes up this thing where on pulls, I find that it's very hard to get the maximal contraction but sometimes you could get five, 10 length and partials at the end of the set. So it may think like, is the reason why the length and partials more effective than a full range of motion rep? Because those people are, it's the average it, it, that you can use more weight and length and partial you could if you're doing a full range of lift. And that's why length and partials are more effective. Hmm. And I'm sure they, that some of these researchers must have accounted for this, but I want yeah, to they have. Up and it, if yeah. you use the same amount of weight, it's still more effective uh, in many of the studies to do longer muscle length training than average muscle length training, which is full range of motion and shorter muscle length training for sure. So they've accounted for that. It's not the weight difference. It seems like it seems like maybe the best hypothesis so far is that um, putting a muscle under a difficult stretch and asking it to generate tension at the same time is hypertrophic. Now that's not just a guess out of thin air. There's now, there are now a few studies, very compelling ones, many more in animal models, but really now in humans that very intense, pure stretching protocols with no lifting of weights at all produce robust hypertrophy. So that's not very practical because these studies are fucking insane. It's like six hours of stretching per week. And you're like, what? But that's not the point. The point of the study is to demonstrate the theoretical ability of stretch mediation to actually cause growth. And so now that we have decent reason to believe that stretch itself causes growth, tension itself causes growth, stretch plus tension seems to be like a really good formula. And so if you're lifting, let's say, only in the top third, you're getting tension. That's great. You're going to get really good growth too, but you won't get your best growth because you're missing the stretch. If you train through a full range of motion, it's probably the best for like mobility and health and uh, ability to play sports and be safe from injury, but it might get you a little bit more hypertrophy still just to do the bottom part or at least load the bottom part 
with more load than than you would at the top part or something or stand in such a way that gravity affects you or the cable affects you more at the bottom and less at the top that seems to be a, a really good idea for now because of that combination oh, excuse me of stretch and tension and uh the peak contraction stuff the mini context in which it works better i think there are but i think there are fewer and further between than many people think and i think the peak contraction stuff maybe uh something people do for that feeling of completeness and that that's mm-hmm. that feeling i would say is bordering on like ocd like it's nice like uh, for example let's say you uh you set up a nice dinner for your wife and she's about to come home and one of the forks is off by like a millimeter from being parallel to the others like you can see that quick and fix it that the probability your wife's ever going to notice and it's going to impact the quality of the date is like negligible and you're really just nuts and so like the fact that you're like i have to finish the squeeze dude i've been there as my good fucking 15 years of my training career is like i gotta go from point a to point b and milk every fucking point including point a and point b sure but when research says like point B doesn't fucking really matter that much time and effort you could have spared on point B instead of crunching my lap pull downs and waiting for a second here, I can do a quick touch and to get two or three more reps of total lap pull downs of which the top third is the real stretchy part. Then it seems to be like, it's a fucking, it makes sense to trade those off. But I will say lastly is there are nuanced ways in which peak contraction emphasis can help. One is a lot of people it really helps with their mind muscle connection. Like Jared Feather has the bicep exercise he invented, which I call the Jerry curl, which is no no better name for it than that. And basically it has you pull your biceps in and it has you come up at the top here. The reason we come up the top here isn't because we think there's a lot of force generation and it's important. It's because that squeeze really engages your biceps, lets them feel it. And then the eccentric after you can stay in touch with your biceps mentally. And it just every rep feels like you're getting more bicep out of it because there are a lot of forearm flexors. Half of the muscles in your wrist cross the fucking elbow. Their forearm flexors, you got the bracts and shit like that. These are big, strong muscles that in many people will just take over for the biceps and be like, don't worry, biceps, take the day off. We'll take care of this. And then you have badass, big ass arms, but you don't have that fucking peak. Where the fuck is the bicep? It's just not that big. So extra mind muscle connection can be a thing that can be accomplished by peak contractions, which might be awesome. Similar idea for back exercises. Some people have trouble feeling their backs. A deep stretch will really help you. But at the top of a row, that ball or that crunch contraction, you're lowering your shoulder, sliding them back, chest out, tummy out, just that crunch, that can help people really connect to their shit and may also be really great. Um, and so there are contexts for the peak contraction being good. It's just like, I'll put it to you this way. If I saw two kinds of people at the gym, one person was getting every single deep stretch of a rep, but kind of missing the peak contraction. Guys who like bench and they lock out here and they come back down. The other guy is coming down, but missing the last couple inches, but locks out hard every time. The first guy is probably going to grow 10% more muscle over the long term than he's capable of than the guy who, who really fixates on that peak contraction. So another way to put it is, I'm not even worried about the peak contraction at this current state of literature too much. As long as you're not missing out the stretch, let me give you a perfect real life example as to how that happens. Guys who do lat prayers, right? Or front lat pull downs, mm-hmm. right? You're on the fucking cable mm-hmm. stack, you're doing the fucking shit. Some guys will come down to their tummy and squeeze for a second, but then only come back up to here and do the thing. Whereas other guys will go all the way super behind their back and then come down and just gently touch the tummy and come back up. That second technique is probably better because it doesn't miss that huge fucking stretch back there. This little technique where you go to here and clip back down, yeah, it feels like your back is working, but you're missing a lot of stretch mediated hypertrophy, which another thing is some people think that feeling your back is working is just feeling the muscles active, but that's actually not how we at RP define mind-muscle connection. That's just called kinesthetic awareness. Like, yes, you're using your last congratulations. My muscle connection means you have to feel a whole lot of burn or tension in the target muscle. Where do you feel more tension in the lats from this clip to the tummy or like this fucking mind bending lats getting ripped out at the top feeling, man, the people talk about my muscle connection and they're like, yeah, I don't get a good one in the stretch. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Let me put you on a leg press, get you a full quad stretch. You will know exactly what it's like to have your quads blow up right in front of you. <laughs> But if you're cutting your depth, yeah, you could the peak can make you feel a certain way. So my muscle connection is a big deal, but 
it's over it's overweighted in many people's minds because they think of it as kinesthetic awareness and not like how can i get my muscle to feel the most burned or most tense in a position and if it's burn or tension we're talking about especially tension it's tough to beat a deep stretch it really just is came up with you train jushi mufu in straight leg deadlifts is yeah. that he said i don't really feel the hamstrings i just feel them stretched and you're like that's what you're supposed to feel this is a stretch move and i was yeah. like okay i feel better because i was having problem with deadlifts is i push my knees back my glute back it feels comfortable because then it's romanian if i push my knees back now i feel this extreme stretching at the, yes. the hamstring and even behind the knee and yes. i thought that was dangerous and i'm apparently i'm supposed to be feeling for this and then that yes, really catapulted <laughs> that catapulted my hamstring training further oh that's I, awesome yeah and so i was doing all leg curls four sets of leg curls twice a week just different and then i in the straight leg deadlifts and pushing the knees back added in one set then two set and now my other leg curl exercises getting stronger even though they've been stagnant for two years that's awesome. now so yeah so it, it definitely was helpful to see that and now that hearing that explained and again those were my reasons for doing the peak this one sake of completeness i feel like the rep doesn't count if the full rep two if I don't squeeze at the top, I can't feel it the whole way down. So sure. I'm losing out on my muscle connection for hard to feel muscles, muscles I'm anal about, but like lats, rhomboids, biceps, hamstrings, lateral quad, they're hard for me to reach. So if I don't squeeze sure. them and feel them, then I can't fight. Once I get a full contra contraction, then I can release it slow and feel it on the eccentric. And likewise, obviously, if I'm squeezing at the top, I'm going to make sure I have an exaggerated eccentric so I can keep that mind muscle connection, feel it in the stretch, and then squeeze it through. I, I may not even do an explosive concentric phase because I feel if you explode on the concentric, the strongest muscle kicks in. And the reason yeah. why you have a weakness is because it's the weakest muscle. And the reason why it's the weakest muscle is you have the least neuromuscular connectivity with that muscle. So you kind of have to bind up the concentric phase to keep mind muscle connection. It's hard to feel muscles. Long head of the bicep will always jump in if I don't control for that short head. I see. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely an individual thing that a lot of people will say, look, I just feel it way better with these uh, P contractions. And then I'm not trying to tell you not to do it then i think it's a fine idea all right so we've got through my eight questions i wanted to if you if you mind i'd like to go through them my understanding of your answers really quick to make sure that i do, and the viewers don't walk away with the wrong impression so establishing mv and mev mrv maintenance volume is if you're doing an x volume and using then that is lower than MV. If you're doing X volume and it's gr and you're growing like strength through progress, then it is over MEV. MRV is if you're doing so much volume and you're so sore that you're now going down again. And MAV is a theoretical sweet spot in between MEV and MRV where you're making progress, but you're not particularly sore or fatigued. So somewhere over MEV, usually very close to MEV. And then as one progresses week to week to week, their MEV will probably have to go up and their MEV will go up until MAV hits MRV, and then the month one must deload. Yeah, something like that, yeah. All right, cool. Um, flipping MRV and MEV. At some point, older or stronger individuals, MEV will be higher than their MRV if they're doing body parts equally so you have to put one to seven of those eight major muscle groups on the mv back burner so that the mrv remains higher than the mev for the target weak point that you're trying to and then in practice you've seen most of the advanced lifters and pros never have more than a split where four of the body parts have to be mv whereas four body parts you can try to um, escalate MEV g with the goal of hitting MAV. Yeah, something like that. All right, cool. And that 
if somebody is slightly sore the next day, they're making progress and they're slightly sore the next day, that's probably closer to MAV than if they're making progress, but they're extremely sore until the next time they hit that body part. I'm not sure about that. But if you're okay. still sore when you hit the body parts repeatedly week on week on week, yeah, you're probably Ooh. not as close to MAV as if you weren't overlapping in soreness. So overlapping soreness means one is most likely closer to MRV or exceeding MRV and is further away than a MAV. All right. Yeah, more likely than not, yeah. All right, so then, then the four, six to 12 reps, it's basically came down on 12 it basically comes down to that 12 reps is more fatiguing than six reps because there's twice as many reps but there's more factors of fatigue involved if it it really have to analyze your logbook or use the rp hypertrophy app and be honest with your input about whether workout was too tough or whether it was just right or whether it was easy and whether you were sore and whether your joints hurt and let the rp hypertrophy app choose the loads and volumes for you then you don't have to worry so much about whether you're doing the perfect thing hmm. doesn't choose your loads but you can alter your loads <laughs> over the long term if you notice that some loads are too fatiguing and not stimulative enough, yeah. Yeah, I found that it would progress. It would always progress my loads um, and reps. I, I found sometimes I would, after a couple mesocycles of the same exercise, even though I started in a 12 rep range, I'd find it in like a six to eight rep range. Hmm. That because it is it preferring load advancement over. Um, rep advancement, which made me think that you that's had, good. yeah. Um, and then fatigue questions we addressed. That's complicated. My metabolic drive hypertrophy. It's the God question. Just because you can't prove God doesn't exist doesn't mean he doesn't. The evidence of absence isn't the absence of us. And the centric. There are studies that indicate. Well, basically, the eccentric question was because of like the other subject of the fiber type is that the, if your primary goal is not getting hurt, you want to go slow enough that you don't get hurt. Also, you want to go slow enough that you know that the correct muscles be hurt. Yeah. There's and also no the absence of evidence on the metabolite stuff. There's plenty of evidence. It's just uh, not as high quality as we would like to have. Oh, wait, so let me, let me, okay, so let's, so there is evidence that the metabolites do not cause muscle growth? There's evidence they do cause muscle growth, except it's not oh, okay. in studies, yeah. Ah, uh, okay, all right, so then it's not even the same situation, that there's direct evidence that metabolic drives hypertrophy, not just mechanical tension, and the people that say it's all mechanical tension 100% of the time, and there's zero metabolic effect are just cherry picking their data and ignoring the data that doesn't fit. Their yeah, data. or they have like a very high, high, high bar of quality for the data that they're willing to admit, uh, and they're saying only direct mechanistic examinations, although if, if, if you want to talk about direct mechanistic evidence, there's not really much of that in humans either for mechanical tension because you'd have to have a pretty convoluted study to figure that out. You'd have to show which exact tension receptors are being hit. You'd have to show that they're reliably, reliably being activated by tension alone, and you'd have to correlate those in a controlled study to gains and see that, that the one variable actually causes the other. So I don't know how many studies have been done like that. I suspect it's somewhere between zero and close to zero. So the tension is just the default hypothesis that most people have. And it's probably either the thing that grows all the muscle or the thing that grows a very large fraction of it. But it may be a little early to say it's the only thing that grows muscle. And most people who say it's the only thing are just trying to put forward a, um, a simpler view of the world than maybe the view of the world in reality. Yeah, it's it's so convenient to it's lumpers versus splitters right so it's like people who want to like make categories and then there's people who just say eh, it's fine. just ignore it so sure. the length and partials thing uh that one was kind of confusing to me so like 
if let's say you're doing a bent row, because I know you're a big fan of bent rows, I used to not count the bent row unless the bar touched my belt. Now I know you go to a sternum, you're a sternum rower, like a more like a pendley row, a traditional, not a Yates. But I used to not count it if it doesn't touch. Now it didn't touch get five, ten more reps if I got one inch, two inch, three inch away from my chest. But to, in order to but um but I only counted them if they touched. And if you don't touch, you've hit failure. Whereas I talked to Kassam Hansen about it and he was like, well, you're, is it really failure? Because you have six, seven more reps, you could get 75% of the length and push or 50%. You know, you might get 10 reps as they get shorter and shorter amplitude. And as your range of motion decreases because the the, the fully contracted portion is harder to achieve, than portion. So, how how does one incorporate length and partials into a set rather than just doing I'm going to do the length in fifty percent for ten reps? It would make sense to me that it would just add in length and partials as a set extender once you can't complete a full rep you could do both yeah okay one or the other yep see which one feels better all right great well i really appreciate you coming on and spending this time discussing this i want to say your philosophies but i know that it's science it's not philosophy but it's i know it's not beliefs but to most of the oh, a lot of these are beliefs. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because there's a very fine line between true science and beliefs, right? Because it, the studies themselves are almost like gospels, and you can choose to include or exclude different religious texts to create your own Bible. It's just like, and I following up Easter, I guess, an appropriate time to make that analogy, but. <sighs> I look at the individual leaders in this field as people who are putting forth their best interpretations of the data. And it's really a lot foggier than the public believes where they think that science is one thing and it's a box and everything inside the box is true and everything outside the box is false. I'm someone who almost lives perpetually outside the box and tries to throw things that are outside the box, inside the box. And then there's people on the inside of the box trying to throw things that are inside the box out of the box. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are not interested in reasoning and probabilities and likelihoods. They're interested in categorical reasoning. This is true and everything else is wrong. I mean, in advanced fields we have, we get much more closer to categorical reasoning. Um, but uh, not all fields are advanced and not all subjects in all fields are advanced. So always have to be comfortable with taking some kind of educated guesses. And we have to do it in light of the best formal literature and in light of our personal experience, coaching wisdom, physiological and anatomical rationale. You got to come up with uh, at the end of the day, you got exercises to do in the real world to get jacked in. You, you can't get everything out of studies. So, someday maybe we will, but then things will be much clearer. For now, you got to use a lot of different reasoning systems and to get your best guess. Is it just me or does it seem that the exercise physiologists have more beef and are more aggressive with each other than the actual bodybuilders who compete on stage with each other? Who are the exercise physiologists? <laughs> well, like <laughs> there's... Like, I've, like, so if I made a list of all the top YouTube influencers with PhDs and whatnot, it seems that they have more beef with each other over these theories and ideas and which theories they believe versus which theories they don't believe than the actual pro bodybuilders that are competing do. Who would make your list? Oh, man. Well, now that's going to... Okay, so I'm not going to limit it to people who have beef but i would say the people that make the list that i watch i'll make a list of who i watch okay so there's you then there is menmo henselman then there would does be not have a phd Mike. he does not have a phd in any field okay okay then there's he's Milo not Wolf. an exercise physiologist okay milo wolf's not an exercise physiologist he is oh okay yeah so Milo, Milo Wolf is not Right. Um, I also 
watch Paul Carter, although I know that he has no formal education. Um, and I, you know, this just like hearing all these different ideas and opinions and I'm open-minded about that. And I'm sure if I gave it some, um, Dr. Jordan, is it shallows? Uh, I think he has a degree in chiropractic and is not an exercise. Physician. That's right. He's yeah, he's a, yeah, he's a doctor of chiropractor. You got right. two so far myself right. and Milo. <laughs> okay. And we agree on almost so, everything. Oh, right, we cool. never get personal well, with each other. All right, cool. So I'm glad you cleared that up for me. Oh, Kassan Hansen, because I don't know how to say his name. Not an exercise physiologist. Okay. Has a degree right. in biochemistry so, from what I recall. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Does so, not publish in the field as far as I can tell. So most of the big time influencers are no more credible than I am. I could just make <laughs> well, videos. You're a pro and you like, have an MD, so I'd say you're more <laughs> credible than almost everyone. <laughs> but, uh, right, uh, yeah, you thing. should be an influencer. You're, I mean, I think, I think Todd, listen, I'm busting your balls here because you said exercise yeah. physiologist. What you mean is influencers. And right, yeah, right. the influencers do have a lot of controversy with each other, which it comes from two perspectives. One, some people are iconoclastic and have their way of thinking and they're open-minded, but also quite incisive, like Menno. Menno is amazing in that regard. Um and then there are other people who are like Paul Carter who seem to just generate all their clout based off of controversy and they're incredibly rude and full of hate. And I have zero respect for Paul personally as a human. I hope he hears that. Uh, he already knows it's true. Uh, he earned it, by the way. Ask most people about Paul. Almost everyone thinks he's a fucking asshole because he's a fucking asshole. And then, yeah, he's going to have controversial views. You never can quite tell if he really believes them or if he's just doing it for clicks or he believes them that week and not the week after. If you've known Paul as long as I have, you've seen him flip flop on views all the time and not in a nuanced way in which his thinking evolves over the, the period, but just because he'll attach himself to one thing or one person and then it'll get real personal and then he'll switch back. So people like Paul and really sort of, sort of more influencer, influencer people with very few degrees or anything super unique to say about it, then yeah, they will get quite controversial. This is just how they do business. And I'm not so much hating on that, but uh, I just, it is what it is. So the funny thing is I just look at it like I'm the same guy I always was. I've been lifting for 32 years and I feel like I learn so much more every year that at yeah. no point do I ever feel like I'm going to take this idea and I'm going to make it my precious and I'm going to try yeah, to Paul does that to everything, by the way. And, I, and it's like, and I'm going to kill <laughs> anybody who tries to say that my precious idea isn't precious to them too. It's like, you know what? For uh, six years from now, I'm going to think everything I said in this video was fucking retarded. I don't know what I'm talking about. I've changed how I've done things. The irony is, is that even though the science keeps changing, I'm not getting much bigger following the science. And when I lifted kind of like Dorian, which was relatively low volume, heavy as yeah. fuck with big barbells, I had a bigger, uglier body. And then now that I've lifted <laughs> with more of a body style to things, and I've used, like, I tried to do the slow this and the slow that, and all I got was a symmetrically smaller body. And then mm. it's like, all right, so trying to balance it all out with, with, Spare a year doing the RP system, and what I got was I, I I was doing every set to failure, but I was doing high volume, and I was getting cold, cold after cold. And then I rewatched what Dorian said, and it was when he said he couldn't recover. What he meant was he kept getting colds. I was like, so and tried the RIR system with the app, and I found that the first half of the mesocycle, I'm almost spinning my wheels, and that. It was the back half of the mesocycle is when I'd really be progress, but then I'd shit the bed in the S systemic fatigue department way quick. So it's like, I've got to find the right way to use the, I think in one of your advanced videos, you said that someone who's advanced, that they might have to start their mesocycle at one RAR. They can't do three RAR and start a mesocycle, but you yourself train like you're an idiot results so are you still training with the three rar in week one and two rar in week two and one rar week three or are you um yeah i mean i'll often train three or four rir and maybe the hardest i'll get to training at the end of a mess sometimes is two rir 
in other cases, I'll go to one and zero. So I don't, I don't claim to train very hard. My relative effort is not very high. I used to train with very high relative effort when I was younger. I dropped and tried to do the RIR system where I did one or two reps in reserve and I got way better results, which were good for a mm -hmm. long time. Then uh, about a year ago, two years ago, I started really trying to push myself harder and training much closer to failure. I got not so great results. And then I backed up and went uh, less close to failure more recently, a few months back, and I got better results again. So for me, it's sort of unequivocal for me that I don't benefit from failure training very much, uh, as much as I do from submaximal training. And uh, I think everyone has to find their own uh, balance there for their own individual needs. Now, is that because of the systemic fatigue? That if yeah. you were doing every body part to two RAR and every set, then your systemic fatigue would be so high you'd get less progress overall. But if you were to train equally everywhere at four RAR, your systemic fatigue is down and you might actually start to grow even though you're not specialized training. Yeah, well, that might be the case. Um, for me, it's definitely systemic fatigue. It's really high with failure training. Um, I'm not sure why it is. One suspicion that Jared and I have had is we've trained a lot of people now and when people tell you they're going to failure, it's nice, but usually they're not. They just kind of stop. And uh, a lot of times, even if they're trying, they're not trying as hard as they could be. When I'm trying to train close to failure, very much to failure and something like that, then I take that as a serious challenge and I want to get every single rep out of my muscles as possible. So I make it emotional. And emotional training is insanely fatiguing training. But uh, it's tough to go to failure without activating any of your emotions because you're like, oh, I'm just kind of stopping here. So that really isn't true failure. I think a lot of people will say they train to failure in my experience, uh, especially people who are at the pro ranks or just below. They don't really train to failure. You get with them, they get three or more, four more reps on every set. And you're like, what the fuck was that coming from? And in my experience, you'll give them two thirds of the normal volume, have them go to actual failure, and they're like completely crushed, just annihilated. And they're like, dude, you want to do this next week? They're like, there's no fucking way I can do this week after week. Like, oh, I thought you said you trained failure all the time. Guess that wasn't true. So I think a lot of people uh, who dog on RIR a need to train to what they think is failure because they train so not hard that for them, RIR2 is easy. And if you're trained really hard, RIR2 is insanely difficult. Uh, but RIR zero becomes psychotic and unsustainable if you train really, really hard, but most people so, don't. So maybe most people should be training to failure. So when I train, it's very similar to the way you said Chris Bumstead trained when you watched his video recently and said, it's like he is taking his sets to failure because he can't complete the last rep, but he looks like he's serene, that he's not yeah. digging deep into some yeah. hellscape and yeah. torturing himself into eking out one or two more reps at all costs. I'll get one grinder, maybe two grinders, and then I'll put it away. Yeah, I you're training to like four RIR or something like oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah. That's oh, what yeah. the problem is? Okay. Okay. I mean, it's not a problem. It's probably for the best. I would still train like that if I were you. <laughs> just modulate okay. your volume. I think if you try to take things real close to failure and go psychotic, you're just going to get uh, overreached and tired, and it's going to suck. Maybe, but maybe it'll work well for you. You should try. So, so like for example, if I'm going and I can't get a rep, like I'm doing dumbbell curls and then I stop halfway through the rep, to me yeah. that's already a failure because I failed to complete one rep. Yeah, that's good. But how hard are you trying? I mean, usually I'm sweating bullets. I'm grinding my teeth. I mean, I'm not it's good calm in any respect. Yeah, now, no, that's good. Rather than digging deep for demons, like what I usually do is I listen to specific music. I remember I sent you um, some samples, like during your presentation, someone threw out Dying Fetus when you asked what's oh, the metal right. band. And then I sent you some Dying Fetus. And like they, I only listen to death metal right now when I'm training so that I can flip mm -hmm. the switch by choosing my playlist. And I don't have sure. to then do childhood trauma type stuff to get <laughs> yeah, yeah. enough. Because I can't fall, like I let the music just trigger it at a subconscious level for me. Sure, and that's really good. So maybe you are training harder than I assessed uh, initially, but yeah. Chris Bumstead didn't look like he was training that hard, so maybe you train a little bit harder. <laughs> I mean, when I, I wasn't going with the facial expressions, but when you look at like my rep speed, if you, like I've got some videos up, if you look at one of my videos for training, um, 
I'll go, it'll be slow grinder or two grinders, and then it'll usually be a failed rep. And then yeah. usually because I know that, I know that one solid grinder is I'm within the range. I'm at like the two IR to one yeah, yeah. IR range with a solid grinder. And that pushing more reps doesn't have exponential mounting stimulus, but has exponentially mounting calcium ions and that therefore I I'm I, going please to don't use calcium ions. So first of all, calcium has also been implicated in the hypertrophic cascade. So a calcium ion release might actually grow your muscle, but yes, <laughs> it, calcium ion release is, is, it absolutely has, is related to fatigue is causative fatigue is one of the thousand things that causes fatigue. It just so happens that some influencer or another is the only term they know recently. And they just talk about it, making them seem sciencey. It's uh yeah, fatigue is fine. I'm not Sorry. actually trolling Paul when I say that. It was that somebody who follows Paul but overrepresents their knowledge base in this field when really they're just quoting Paul Carter. That when I tried to get them to explain themselves, is yeah. what do you mean by calcium ion? Can you explain to me where in the cell is the calcium ion going and how does it interfere with muscular contraction? They threatened to beat me up. Oh, so really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I was like, all right, right. So now that you're threatening to beat me up, like I know that you don't know what you're talking about. For sure. so I was, I was, so God. now I do it all the time. I, I'm just like, <laughs> it's just a big runny joke for the That's only funny. people know about. Yeah. It's like, cause, oh man, it's like, I watch way too much Ben Shapiro. You're not going to win this. You know, I was like, I've learned Dude, how for to sure. Really Come on, come on. I'm just asking you a question. You're getting all upset. Like, clearly, you're out of your depth. That's okay. Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate you taking all this time to talk to me. This is one of my favorite interviews. I'd love to have you back for more QA next time. Um, obviously, get a hold of me with any questions you have about health related stuff. If you want to talk more about kidneys or whatever, I'm always open to you. Um, awesome. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much uh, for having my me on. Pleasure. My pleasure. All right, everyone, stay tuned for another episode and maybe another sense when we have another major holiday, and we will talk to you soon. Hopefully, Mike will get his pro card this year. You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. <laughs>